It's my pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker, Dr. Yang Zhao. Dr. Zhao is an internationally known scholar, author, and speaker whose works focus on the implications of globalization and technology on education. He currently served as, serves as the presidential chair and associate dean for global education in the College of Education at the University of Oregon. Prior to jo joining the University of Oregon in 2010, Dr. Zhao was a distinguished professor at the College of Education at Michigan State University, where he also served as the founding director of the Center for Teaching and Technology and executive director of the Confucius Institute and the U.S.-China Center for Research on Educational Excellence. Dr. Zhao was born in China's Sichuan province. He received his bachelor's degree in English language education from Sichuan Institute of Foreign Languages in 1986. After teaching English in China for six years, he came to the United States in 1992 as a graduate scholar studying at Linfield College and at the University of Illinois, where he received his PhD in 1996. He's published over 100 articles and 20 books, including Catching Up or Leading the Way, the title of his presentation today, and most recently, World Class Learners, Educating Creative and Entrepreneurial Students. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Yang Zhao. Good morning. If I can get this up there, it will work even better. OK, thank you. So uh, uh, Jim was hinting that I would disagree with uh, Dr. Hanishek. I would dare not. You know, it's, uh, Rick, I agree with everything you said, Rick. And uh, so there's no show to watch now, guys. It's not, it's not going to be interesting. And uh, Rick, I, I, you know, we've, we've known each other for a long time. And I actually appreciate very much of what he said. I think, but however, I want to interpret your message, maybe slightly different, if I may. The, I think what he was, the graph shows, as he said, not necessarily what you need to teach, but rather shows the quality of education. That is, it's not at the time, it's not only the investment, it really has not to do with the action, what you gain. I think it's very dangerous to draw from that conclusion that how we should design our education curriculum or systems, but that's very likely it's actually what's happening now in a lot of uh, state capitals and federal capitals from design around that. The, the other thing I think I also appreciate what Rick said was that uh, it's teachers. Teachers matter a lot more than standards. I, uh, many of you may be aware of that. I've been writing a lot about uh, why I think the common core standards, uh, it's not only a distraction, it's a waste of time. Actually, it's pretty bad. And recently, uh, had a little debate with Mark Tucker on the Washington Post blog around that issue. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's, I, some people think I'm opposed to standards. I'm actually not. I just oppose the comma and core. If they were not a comma or core, I would love the standards themselves. It's just, you have to think about from that perspective. So that said, but I, I am here to try to share with you what I think. I, I think it may be a, a slightly take of, of the, the different issues, or maybe not so different. The first thing I think we, we would all agree that uh, American education is not doing great. But the question is where to go. I think that's where, where shall we go is the biggest question. So with that, you know, I think I've, uh, I have to give you this treat. I've shown this picture so many times to different people to ask people what these uh, pictures are, you know, so you make a guess. It's, I love this. Uh, I took this picture when we were in South Africa together, actually at the Cape Town airport by the uh, luggage claim. Uh, it's advertisement of a product, and I've used this to test people's uh, cultural competency in different countries. And uh, so, what do you think this product is? Come on, Colorado? You don't know? Anybody? Navigation, Navigation system. That's very smart, but it's a boring answer. It's actually, <laughs> it's a, it's the correct answer, but it's a boring answer. Right? The, and the most interesting answer I got from Australia was they think it's Viagra. <laughs> you see the connection now? Yes? You do? Good, thank you. Uh, 
No, it, it is the correct answer. It's uh, yeah, just uh, if you look at uh, you know some of the next one, you will see right. You know, it's a very smart uh, you know navigation um, kind of thing. You know, uh, advertisement. When I said actually, I found this very interesting. It's um, I use this to remind us that when we improve our schools, like we're improving a GPS system, we must know where we want to go. Otherwise, no matter, no matter how good the GPS is, if you don't tell its destination, it won't get you there. And sometimes in schools, we might forget that. I think now a lot of times, when uh, Rick was talking about improve achievement, we might have forgotten the education purpose. So this is, I think, in this country right now, regard all the policies, we spend so much time trying to, trying to debate how much student test scores should account for account, you know, teacher evaluation, and uh, which grade should be teaching what subjects, right? You know, so we, we, well, how many subjects should we teach in first grade, second grade, how many topics, coverage, all those kind of things. I think we'd be debating the wrong thing. We're so lost. I, I want to ask us really, to think about if we want to improve American education, what is it that we want to improve? And how we do that? So here's what I'm thinking about. I'm playing with my iPad, by the way. So that's not, that's not fun. I won't show you that. Why. I will show you that, why that picture. OK, actually, I'll show you that, to explain this to you why. This is a, uh, can you guess who these people are? Flight attendant. No, no, they actually, they are, they are well, almost like a, the attendants on high-speed rail in China. It's made a in big news in China that so they are going to be trained to serve on the train. That's, how is ha having a chopstick in your mouth going to help you serve uh, better on the train as attendant? Well, it will help you smile better. I'd rather have a good real meal than a just perfect smile. Do you see what I mean? That's something we're improving the wrong thing. That, that's for in education. Maybe we'll be improving the wrong thing, not necessarily. So think about that. It's, uh, and uh, the, the, the other thing is that this is my daughter, by the way. So uh, she is uh, she's 14 in high school, and uh, this is uh, where I normally start thinking about what education is, and therefore, are we being be are we behind or are we ahead, and how do we do this kind of thing? So, you, if you think of yourself as a parent, not as a teacher, you're educating your own children, not other people's children. How do you know you've given your children a good education? You bet this, I bet you every day you wake up in the morning, ask yourself, am I doing a good job as a parent, right? You, you, you think about that. Um, I, don't, I can't tell if I've done a good job with my, my daughter yet, but uh, my, my son is in college. I just saw him uh, last weekend uh, in Chicago. He's going to graduate from the University of Chicago uh, and with an art history uh, degree major, I think, in that. And he, he spent a lot of my money all these years. And, and my time, you can imagine, right? It's going, so now I know pretty sure I, I, I want to know how to judge the education I've purchased for him or he has acquired by himself in all these years. And he went to both public school and boarding school uh, with no child left behind, set uh, in. Actually, I took them out of uh, public school, sent them to boarding school. So no child left behind. This cost me some money. And in, now... How do I know if he's get a good education? I, I think after all these years, I would say on June, I think 15th or 16th this year, 2013, when he get this diploma from uh, University of Chicago, if he does not fly back to Oregon with me, I think that's success. It's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> doesn't move back into my basement, that's uh, ultimate educational success. Would you agree? I think it's, uh, so all of you should think about this. It's, uh, you go home, you should change your, your model on your school building code, keeping your children out of your basement. That's your, I, I think that's our ultimate education. So I'm thinking about not global competitiveness, not national economic growth. I'm thinking about my children out of my basement. That's my goal of education. Actually, that's not very easy if you think about it. You have to be financially independent, socially independent, and belong to a community which is basically a financially independent contributing member to a society. That's all education is about, about individuals. But are we doing a good job or not? If you think today, right now, I think uh, we have to look into the future, not necessarily in the past. Because I think people would argue that we have entered a new economy. 
In the new economy, traditional lines of jobs have been disappearing. If you read uh, uh, economists, you know, a lot of economists like uh, Golden and Katz from Harvard talk about the race between technology and education. And in the US, we have uh, we are seeing the disappearance of the middle class jobs. Uh, did Romney come over here and Obama? Remember their debate? Their biggest debate, the biggest point was about how do we create jobs? Or rather, actually, how do we take the jobs back from the Chinese? I think they're all their debates. Actually, they had one central point. Their debate is called who hates China more? That's basically, that's a, and uh, they, well, basically, they want to prove that you know, I, I, jobs are taken by the Chinese. Well, it's half true, it's not, you know, because China is actually now having trouble with keeping their jobs from the Vietnamese as well. So their jobs just move around, it's something. So because of technology, of globalization, outsourcing, and machines replacing, taking jobs away, it's very simple. So, well, you know, the traditional middle class jobs are gone. But we have historically relied on creators, innovators to make jobs. They've always done those things. But traditional innovators can make more jobs than current innovators. Think about Henry Ford. He actually made a lot more jobs for everybody. Now, look at uh, uh, actually Google, look at uh, Facebook, look at Twitter. They don't need factory workers. Those guys are, are, you know, make billions of dollars, but don't employ nearly as many people as before. Not necessarily paying the high kind of wages that they need. So now today, I think the necessity is for us to turn around to think about what keeps your children out of their basement is to become a creator and entrepreneur in that sense. To not to find jobs, but to create jobs. Schools have not traditionally been tasked with the job to prepare, cultivate creative people. We have always been trying to help people to find jobs. So we have this career readiness employment skills. That's our traditional model. It's been doing all those things. And a lot of our comparison today, I think, has a lot to do with that, with that model. Who has been a successful, uh, in a sense, um, cultivator of those employable skills? If you look around, I, mean, I have a little diagram. To show. This is quite cool stuff, you know, okay. By the way, when you use an iPad, it's really fun. To, you can play with these numbers, okay. So if I, I, I give you this, this is what I call the traditional paradigm of education. US and almost everybody else, except those boutique programs like Wardorf, like uh, Reggio, like Montessori, they all follow the same model. We start by making a guess of what skills, what knowledge are important. Starting in the 1800s, you know, Herbert Spencer, a British philosopher, came up with the essay asking the question, what knowledge is of most worth? We kept asking the question. To this common core standards doing the same thing. Because we're trying to define what will make you college and career ready. What will make you a good person? What will keep you out of your parents' basement? And our school's job is, in essence, to put that into a curriculum, put it into textbooks, and make sure our teachers can teach that our kids can acquire that. So we don't really care who you are. We don't care what you're interested in. All this diversity to me is nice meat I grind you through the sausage maker and turn out to good sausages. That's what we need. Yeah, that's, that's the process, if you think about it, right? It's, uh, I mean, of course, we have different kinds of sausages. We have Harvard sausage, Stanford sausage. We have the Colorado, uh, Denver University, University of Denver sausage. We have the community college sausages, but they are sausages nonetheless. You know, we have different, lots of different grades, but the same thing. So that's a traditional model. So today, when you look at the traditional model, what has been, who has been successful, who has not been successful? So I have, uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, Dr. Hanishek, I don't have a lot of different data. I'm just going to bring some s small set of data and thinking from an individual perspective. So first of all, I got a number of, oh, by the way, you know, all the slides is, uh, uh, I will give to Macro, but also it's on my website. Feel free to download this. They have a lot more slides that I can use. Okay, it's, uh, I was held accountable for the number of slides I make. Uh, I'd be paid by the number of slides I make. So I made a lot of them. You can use all the slides you want, okay? <laughs> it's, uh, the, now, you can download the slides I, I use. And uh, now, I was going to take about the first question I like to ask, big question to ask, is China. Because I come from China now after uh, 
here in uh, Rick's talk, I feel like I've moved to the wrong country. Should have never left China. You know, just China is doing so great now, and uh, uh, ed educational. Actually, everybody thinks China is doing so great. And uh, by the way, it's good time to be Chinese. If you haven't tried, you should give it a shot. You know, just ed <laughs> educationally, people th respect you, think you know everything about education. You're smart in math. You're good at everything. You know, and we had uh, Amy Shaw, Tiger Mom, who writes books, gets commands, the best thing. You know, list. It's great. Okay, but I had a first big question. Why did not China have a a big party, a big party to celebrate? It's not the the governing ruling communist party. That's actually quite big, but it's a uh, not that. It's China, as you know, in the last round of the PISA test, 2009 PISA assessment, China, for the first time, actually, any Chinese entities joined this, except the other territories, which I you know, Chinese Taipei and Hong Kong, which, you know, uh, politically, I'm not going to get into that. But actually, under the Chinese communist rule, this is the first time Shanghai participated. Actually, there are 10 more provinces participated. Data wasn't released. So, but Shanghai took number one last time in every category. Now, that's amazing. That already sailed China as the education giant. That got America, got a lot of attention from the US. I think uh, uh, Obama called this a Sputnik moment. Sputnik moment. Remember Sputnik moment sometime? OK. And uh, Arnie Duncan called this a uh, a wake-up call, and uh, then we responded quickly. By the way, there's are the top 10 countries. In the U.S., I don't know where it would be. The screen's too small. You can't find the U.S. somewhere on there. It's, you can't find it's top 10 countries. <coughs> By the way, people are trying to explain this. Uh, how did these countries do so well? And someone asked about the states where they spend less, less money, but they're doing great. I found an answer for you when I was looking at your graph. All those states who spend, don't spend money but gain a lot are nice places to be. Do you notice just now with uh, his graph, Florida, Colorado? You don't have to spend money. People will come, you know, the high, the high wages. It's, uh, and the miserable place, Wyoming, who wants to go to Wyoming? There's no one much to spend, right? Wyoming, Rhode Island, Maine, that miserable place in cold, you know. Just, <laughs> so I think I explained to you those states, just, just move to a better place. If you think your state you know, is not getting the, the enough achievement, just take over Hawaii and you know, invade Hawaii. <laughs> By the way, Hawaii didn't do well, actually. I saw that. Uh, anyway, so people don't explain this pizza. How did these guys do so well? If you look at top five countries, take Finland out. What do they have in common? They're all Asian countries. They're not only Asia, they're East Asian countries. Not only East Asian countries, they all use chopsticks. That's what's in common, you know. So that's what it's. Uh, if you use chopsticks, you improve your pizza scores. That, that's basically. It's, uh, I mean, I, I think that actually is, uh, this accounts for 90% of the variation of top five countries, right? 90% of top five countries at least. Uh, but anyway, so we can have a lot of explanations. America got involved in a lot of China and uh, Mark Tucker from uh, National Center of Education and the Economy did a book. I was quite annoyed by the title of the book. It's called Surpassing Shanghai. Surpassing Shanghai, which reminds me of the decline of the United States of America. You know, by the US was great. We were back to uh, back to back uh, World War champions twice. Remember that? You know, just we fought the good wars, those guys. And I came here. America always had uh, bigger dreams. Now this one is called Surpassing Shanghai. Is defined as a national agenda for America as a national dream, which is really actually not that ins inspirational to me, right? If you, if you remember US, this country was founded on some very big dreams, a country without kings and queens and lords, right? That's quite amazing. We actually strive to end racial segregation, slavery. That's a big dream. We send uh, people to the moon. That's a big dream. Ever since I came to this country, the dream has getting worse and worse, smaller and smaller dreams. I think uh, I remember in 19, uh, actually under uh, George W. Bush, a second under No Child Left Behind, I was really startled to find he's defined a national dream as reading. Remember reading, like everybody can read. That's not a national dream. It shouldn't be a national dream, national goal. I mean, it may be a, 
a tough personal goal for him, but uh, should not have become <laughs> national dream for, for, for that matter. It's, think about it. It's, uh, for the most developed country, literacy, seriously, as a national goal, that's sub-Saharan countries. That's the national floor, national starting point. And now I want to surpass Shanghai. Further annoys me. But anyway, so there's actually, that's not, we're not the only country. Many countries have aspired to surpass Shanghai. Australia, for example, the Grattan Institute report came out last year saying that students in Shanghai are two years ahead of us in, on the PISA and the math. And in the US, oh, yesterday, guys, you watched the, the game, right? You know, so so you've, whatever fans you are, I know nothing about football. I know nothing. If, if you guys made football the common core, I would have failed right away, OK? But thank God I didn't. However, I, I do watch football commentaries. So here's the next one is a quote from uh, uh, a Pennsylvania governor, Ed Randell. I mean, that, what's the Philadelphia team? called Eagles? The Eagles. I used to think it was the Beatles, but no, it was Eagles. Anyway, so a few years ago, the, the Eagles had a game, and they had to postpone it because of winter storm. And China was involved in this somehow. China was dragged into this thing. And so Ed Randell made this comment on radio. He was very mad at them postponing the game for a little snow. You know, he said, this is what he said. He said, uh, We've become a nation of usis. <laughs> the Chinese are kicking our butt in everything. If this was in China, do you think the Chinese would have caught off the game? People would have been marching down to the stadium. They would have walked, and they would have been doing calculus on their way down. That's, uh, <laughs> now, if uh, you, you think about that, that's, uh, China is getting serious stuff. You know, so not only, but by the way, China doesn't even play football. You know, that's that's interesting part. And, not only, I know, we got governors admiring secretaries of education, scholars, and in Britain, the secretary of education uh, of the new government, uh, Michael Gove, wrote in the Telegraph, said, uh, I'm happy to confess, I'd like us to implement a cultural revolution just like the one they've had in China. Education secretary, by the way. Like Chairman Mao, we've embarked on a long march to reform our education system. So you get all this important people talking about how great China is, even, you know, past was great, everything is just wonderful. So you think if we, the Chinese should celebrate. China, BBC called China the cleverest country, you know. It's, uh, I'm sure actually this round of pizza when it comes out, China is going to be a score great again. And China is a country who is eager to celebrate any international achievement. At this time, I was acting in China when the data were released, they did not celebrate. Why? That's the big question. The why actually is quite interesting. The why is simple is that Chinese education is the best. They think it's the worst. They're from the top government to the, the, uh, the general public because they said we, we can't produce a Steve Jobs. The Chinese education has killed off our ability to create, to innovate. And China desperately needs that. When it shifts away from uh, economy built on cheap labor to an economy that requires innovation and knowledge. And this is very hard for China to swallow right now. And they all blame the education system that has just become the best in the world that everyone wants to become. And if you look at some of this data, this is old data, but I can't find new data. Uh, this data is hard to find uh, because it's always kind of delayed. It's called patent data. Patents data, that's basically is look at China in 2008 as jointly recognized by three international patent offices. China had only 473 filings. This year, I saw the data, domestic filings in China, number of patents have already surpassed the US. But that doesn't count. It means you simply filings, and you don't know what kind of invention it is. So this is shows China was 20% of the world's population, 9% of the world's GDP. China actually spends lots of money on R&D right now, but accounts for 1% of patent filings in the, by any international, by three international organizations. Now you have want to think about this. How could this happen? If China wanted Steve Jobs, if great people or cr great innovators are born, if you think it's innate, China would have by statistically more Steve Jobs born in China than in the US because China has 1.4 billion people almost four times of the US population. 
So China should have at least four times more baby Steve Jobs born. What happened to those baby Steve Jobs? And they believe that education somehow has damaged that. And the second big question has to do with in the US data. Uh, the model minorities. Model minorities are a term that's, that's really a racist term created to describe the Asians. They believe the Asians were model minorities. They happily do their laundry. They don't complain. They make it into middle class. That's really, that's the, the, the origin. They said, so in the US, there was no racism. You know, look at those guys can make it. Why can't others make it? It's very complex. But the term now actually continues to be used. There's a lot of disputes in education circle right now. I don't know if you've been reading New York Times uh, right before uh, Hurricane Sandy. There was a big, an, another storm, but of course, uh, compared to Sandy, it was nothing. The storm has to do with uh, the overpopular representation of Asian population in New York's high schools, the select high schools. New York State has about eight select high schools, including Stuyvesant, you know, Brooklyn High. Because the admission of those high schools were based on test scores of one test. So, right now, over 50% of the student body are Asians. In Stuyvesant, over 72%. Remember, the Asians' population is about, oh, I think, less than 17% of the whole thing. So there's a big lawsuit against this. So that's what the Chinese, the Asians, are becoming academically so successful. Of course, I don't have to remind you, the Tiger Mom book kind of swept over uh, the U.S. and Western countries. And if you look at any of the data from NAEP, the Asian groups have always outscored other ethnic groups, the Asians. Now, if you look at another indicator of uh, academic success, Asians, as 5% of the U.S. population nationally, but 15 to 25% Ivy League in Rome, it's not Asians. Remember, actually, many Ivies have to cap them. There are too many Asians have perfect SAT, SAT scores, great GPAs, and perfect record of community services. Perfect, all those. And we got 24% Stanford. I think Ricky ran a lot of Asians, I bet, right? It's, uh, and 46% USA Berkeley. Yeah, they can't, I don't think they capped them, not much. And USA Los Angeles, if you go there, USA LA stands for USA lots of Asians. That's why you go there. When you find out, it's, uh, no. You got all this great, outstanding academic achievement. But, and in life, those outstanding, remarkable achievements somehow get lost, did not translate into leadership positions. For example, new data show that about 2% of the Fortune 500 top leadership positions, board members, or Asians. That's not even to the representation 5%. So now the Asians, of course, we've been thinking, reflecting, say, what happened? Is it a good education? Is it a bad education? Or maybe, of course, we would still think there's racial stereotypes. There is a glass ceiling for the Asians, which actually, to be culturally proper, you should call it the bamboo ceiling. That's why we have a new term for this. It's, uh, the, so now, think about that one. What did we lose? Why aren't we happy? Ed what you gain, what do you lose? Now, the next piece of data <laughs> has to do with what Rick was presenting. Why is America still here? If you're a Canadian, you ponder this question every morning. Right? So why are you still here? It's, uh, now, if you're not Canadian, if you're America, I think what, what, what uh, Rick was saying is historical data. Because every day, I was thinking about this question number three, no. You know, are we catching up? No. Because we are, we, you hear all this college board news, and a lot of people saying American education is in decline, is getting worse every day, every year. I can tell you this. If you look at any historical test scores, American education is not in decline, it's not getting worse, it has always been bad. Has always been bad, and very bad, actually, if you look at any of the data. If you look at uh, American education, we were worse than, uh, than the Soviet Union, remember 1958, Sputnik. We were worse than Japan, 1983, nation risk. Now, with two minute minutes, we're worse than China and India. This the quantitative data. You can read a lot of these books about this. And historically, test scores. Like we've been a nation of bad test takers since 1960s. If you look at the first international mathematics study in the US, US 12th graders ranked 12th out of 12 countries. 
That's pretty bad. You can't get worse than that. If you have that as a starting point, America can only get better, right? If you test scores, took like a rankings. Now this is, has been bad for a long time. We have had a bad education, measured at least in this way for a long time. But America is still here. Not only here, according to President Obama, America still has the largest, most prosperous economy in the world. No workers are more productive than ours. No country has more successful companies or grants more patents to inventors and entrepreneurs. If you check this against economical data, these are actually true and more factual than some of Obama's other facts. <laughs> now, how did this happen? The question, so I have three big questions. Why China is not happy, even though you have this perfect score, people think you're great. The Asian minorities have perfect academics, uh, you know, outstanding performance. And the US, despite this whole thing, is still here. So what are the possible explanations? I mean, for this one, you know, US, I'd like to think immigrants like me come here, saved you guys, you know, just, just come in, yeah, you know, you know, we Asians saved you. No, it's not very possible. Labor statistics show even in the most actually highly high tech industry, computer science, less than 10% of computer scientists, engineers are foreign born. So somehow, you guys, the people born here, despite your poor test scores, you might have done something right, or maybe there's a proportion of people have done something right. So how do we explain this? Uh, oh, by the way, there's other, some other data about uh, international uh, the data. I'm, I'm not gonna do this then. The, the, the Keith Baker data shows that international studies don't predict as much as what uh, Doc Hanashek showed, but I, I'm not gonna show that, so just to avoid disputes, okay. Uh, <laughs> disagreement, I mean, you can, we, we can talk about it later. Now I wanna say about, I wanna get to the explanation part. That's more, more interesting. So how do you explain this then? So I wanna explain by what you measure. Basically, what makes good education? We're asking, what is good education? What do you want for your own children? for your own grandchildren, some of you. So there's some explanation number one. It comes from this data, again, it's disputable data. You may have seen this data from uh, Loveless, Tom Loveless, and that's from Tim's. Tim's data released. It's consistent in this way. Asian kids, Singaporeans, Koreans, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, you know, Japanese, always outscore American kids. American kids are way below in mathematics and science on Tim's the trends in trans math mathematics study. But on those studies, they always ask two other, three other questions. Enjoyment, confidence, and value. Do you think it's important? And as you can expect, Americans, being Americans, they are mathematically ignorant, but they are extremely confident. <laughs> Americans' confidence outscore all, you know, all the Asian countries. So that's what the data you have, okay. Now if you, if you think about Americans, this is very consistent. Uh, you know, the most recent piece, uh, uh, Tim's, just released last year, you can see this. The top five nations, Korea, Singapore, Chinese, Taipei, Hong Kong, Japan, they outscore all the other Anglo uh, countries, uh, US, England, Australia, but look at the confidence. Number one score, number one Korea, only 3% of eighth graders believe they're good at mathematics, while US got 24%. We're way 100 points below them. Americans are confident. And actually, the Asian countries, you can read this. This is all the news I gather from Asian countries. They scored so high, but all the countries are worried about. The children have no interest, no enthusiasm, and don't value. In Hong Kong, for example, it's number one in the reading score. But their students have no interest in reading. So you can read, but I don't want to read. What are you, are you expecting? And then in mathematics, you know, look, Singapore, this was big before, was number one, but only 18% of Singaporeans think they do well in mathematics. And in the US, we got 40%. This is 2003 data. So this is um, what I have to think about. This inverse relationship across countries, it's very interesting. Domestically, you know, in, within a country, the this, this correlation is positive. Kids have higher scores, you know, have higher confidence, but across nations, across education systems, this is always negative. The same thing for the PISA, actually, the same thing for the PISA on the science interest. You know, for example, if you think about, uh, uh, you think about Finland. You think Finland was number one in 2006, PISA, 
But Finland was very worried. For example, said, this is a from Finnish document. It said, uh, when asked about their personal interest in different areas and aspects of science, Finnish students express less interest than their peers in most of other OECD countries. Across the countries, the correlation between students' attitudes and attainment was negative. When students from relatively low performing countries express the highest interest. So the fans are very worried about students' lack of interest in science because they think that might predict something wrong. And then, of course, you know, the, the correlation on the PISA is science scores correlates negatively with future science orientation at 0.83 and future science job point negative, I mean 0.53. Means the more you, the higher your test scores, the less interest you have. You say, God, you know, why, why do we teach people who are not interested in this stuff? So what matters? Okay. Then I'm going to drive you to another level, which I've done, is talk about confidence. I took the PISA rank into another global assessment called a Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. And overall, the correlation between the country's PISA ranking and the country's perceived entrepreneur confidence capacity is negative. So this, I think, at first of all, explains partially in my thinking. The US, despite its poor test scores, somehow has enough people who are confident or crazy enough to start business. You know, each year we, we lose, I mean, I, I call the Kaufman Foundation, about three million jobs. The US has been able to adapt and transform through all the years, coming up with the new businesses. Existing industries lose about three million jobs a year. We need new people to create jobs. And somehow out of those, we got enough people who are confident, creative, and interested enough to make something. And maybe like with some joke about it, we may not know math, but you're confident and arrogant enough to start a business, then you employ the Chinese to do the math for you. <laughs> it's called outsourcing. It's a, that, that's one possibility. So of overall, the total population, you may lock, but in China instead, everybody so good complied with the test score, drive up but then they may have lost interest to start own business, to run something. If actually we go to China right now, the new industry, most of the new industry has been supported not by so-called academically successful individuals. The new wave of China, actually, the, the new economy since 1980s, the first wave of business enterprises, uh, private enterprises, were started by most of all ex, ex cons you know, ex you know, inmates that, when they were released. It was really interesting to do those things. So just think about this as a different way. The second explanation I come up with has to do with Lady Gaga. You can swap Lady Gaga with Kim Kardashian or Honey Boo Boo, doesn't matter who you want to swap with. The whole point is that how come this otherwise useless people become so useful? <laughs> right? It, I mean, if you think about what, do, what does Kim Kardashian do? Right? Nothing, right? Just think about, I mean, can you believe uh, Honey Boo Boo had a more of a higher viewer rating one night over the national uh, Republican National Convention over any one channel. Can you believe that? You know, so it, it's, it's, I know you guys shake your heads, right? but that's precisely my point. You say why? You know, well, I think in the U.S., U.S. educational system somehow allow these people to exist and carry them through the process. Remember, I mean, Steve Jobs from uh, perhaps Lady Gaga's perspective, is as crazy as Kim Kardashian, right? All those we call extremely ultra-creative people or innovative people, entrepreneurs, are on the uh, outliers. As outliers, if you are, remember the sausage making machine? If I cannot squeeze in the process, you're successful. So the more successful you are in squeezing people, in forcing them to comply, the less likely you're going to have these people to survive. That's why I'm so opposed to the Common Core Standards. For example, let me, let me give you this good example. Lady Gaga meets my father's water buffalo. Okay. Uh, I grew up in this village in China. In a, in a, we, have a, we used to rely on water buffaloes. If you were in my village, the most important skill for boys was driving the water buffalo, was being able to successfully water buffalo. So the Common Core Subject in my village driving water buffalo for boys and sewing for girls. Think about that. Then. Now, if my village run a successful school, that would make sure every boy can drive the water buffalo successfully. Right? And if you're not good at it, 
They will throw you in the river and just drive you to America like me. I wasn't good at this then. So now I end up in Colorado talking about this stuff, you know. I was not good at, any, at that subject. Now, if you think about th th this process, in essence, other countries, like Asian countries, we, even though we try to, we have a nine-year compulsory education. But as you know, all Asian countries, every school, every father, we find a way to sort you into different things. Because Asian countries, a lot of time, education is not criterion reference, it's norm referenced. It's not about what you know, it's how much more you know on this test than your neighbor. You can't, your good is defined by being better than others. So in essence, you're always ranked. That's what the, you know, the, uh, um, Amy Chua, the professor of uh, Tiger Mom said about always be number one. So being number one, there's only one number one. Remember this thing? We're not, we, China is not Lake Wobegon, you know. Not all children are above average in China. So that, that's, that's impossible. So when you, when you go up there, how far can you drive? In essence, you damage the, the confidence. Once you sort, if you're not good at any given time, you'll be out of the system. So that's how it happens. We don't preserve a Lady Gaga. So that actually kind of explains what I think. There are two types of education. The education of this idea is that um, Think about, oh, also, that's another little explanation I want to give this to you. The, the different materials we can afford. Think about the typical school in the U.S. versus schools in China. This is what actually we talk about money. Does money matter? You know, sometimes international data, I think this one, uh, Rick, I may want to discuss with about. Does money matter? Depends on what you measure. Do you remember when you were in college at once? You might have drank those $3 bottle of wine. You did? Some of you did. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, you, 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 you went to Boulder, if you know that. That used to be the famous school for something. You know, just, you know, a, now, if you did that, now you drink, let's say, a $30 bottle of wine. What's the difference? If you measure simply by how fast you get drunk, there's no difference. $30, $3, $300, there's no difference. If you only measure alcoholic content, it's about other things. So if you only measure by test scores, I can get a high, good test score from this by village in math as well I can get from a well-equipped field with uh, music instruments, sports, everything else, museums. The value doesn't add from there. But in my village, I could not. I, mean, I could have become a Justin Bieber. You can imagine me. It's a, but I couldn't. I didn't. I would never find out because I had no access to music. I had no access to music. Now here, of course, over here, if you only measure by the other part, we're reducing this to something you can basically teach with $10. So what's the difference between $10, $10 education and $10,000 education? So let me actually try to end this idea to how do we explain this. American education followed an uh, employee-based model, associate making. But we have not been a good sausage maker. American, American education has been a broken sausage making machine that happens to make a few, some, some bacon, you know, that, that's if you, so you like to call it in, in a way. How did this, this happen? America is broken because of the uh, Lydia and uh, Golden and, and Lawrence Cass called them the traditional virtues of American education. The traditional virtue of American education makes a less effective sausage maker, but happens to, by accident, cultivate a few Confident, creative, entrepreneur people. What are the traditional virtues? Yeah, he calls public provision, public funding, separation of church and state. But more importantly, they, they said, it's the decentralized system with local control. Locally controlled curriculum, locally controlled assessment, pedagogy, teacher hiring, staff evaluation. That allows us to make more innovation, but at the same time, you can't standardize across the country. So you would lose, maybe on average, but you would allow some people to grow faster, grow better, you don't have to wait, wait for the entire nation. The second thing I like is called an open and forgiving system. America has the best second chance education system in the world. If you are not good in kindergarten, try in first grade. If you fail elementary, you get a chance in secondary school. Drop out from high school, no problem, we got a GED for you. You know, we got all those kind of uh, uh, second chances. What it does, it allows people 
late bloomers and you know, early bloomers in prodigies to explore, to find out interest. It forgives your youthful transgressions and uh, still gives you a chance to do something. We don't search, we don't define you when you are five year old, six year old, but at the same time, the system, lack of benchmarks, lack of gateways, lack of accountability, will indeed make you a less effective sausage maker. Do you see what I mean? So this is, we, we, I call this whole thing trade-offs. What are you going after is very important. What education defines you. So in my mind, what I would like to think, Americans so far, we have been, we are still here purely by accident. American education does not deliberately cultivate creativity. We don't do it any better than any other countries. We just care it less successful for being kind of a sloppy, you know, sausage making machine. You know, we're, we're not as effective at stifling creativity as Asian countries. By the same, we don't have test scores. So today, if you agree with me that we need everybody to be creative, entrepreneurial, globally competent, we need a new paradigm. The new paradigm would be not about reducing human diversity, but expanding human diversity. Instead of trying to look for what skills human beings might need in the future, we should look at every student's passion and find out, say, what can they best become? Remember, if Lady Gaga is useful, anyone can be useful. <laughs> and if anyone can be useful, our school should change. This is my biggest challenge for us. The direction we have to go is to, with so much money investing in us, and you still don't have enough money, but with such a country, America cannot afford to catch up to others. We must lead the way. We have led the way. The only way for America is to move forward. The only way for America is to move forward is to build on its traditional strength, not trying to copy us. Remember, all the Asian countries are catching up to the U.S. economically. They are copying the models of U.S. education. America, there's no point for us to go back to say, what Shanghai does, surpassing Shanghai, that's, I think, a silly proposal. It's, uh, and what we need to do is have this new paradigm to be the first to take on the so-called progressive education, not as something nice to do, but as an economical necessity. And what the, the, the economic necessity will become is basically three, I have three elements. And I don't have time to show you, but I will show you this one. The three elements I, I outline in the new paradigm. Number one is a personalized educational experience. Education is to enhance a student's strength, not fix their deficit. Don't hold a student's back if just, just because they cannot meet the standards. If you were trying to do that, if you held Michael Phelps back, Michael Phelps would still be hooked on phonics in some basement. He would not be <laughs> swimming. You can't do that. You have to personalize it, support it, and I dare any of our school to say, truly, let's get rid of our prescription. Let's start from each child. Look at their strength. Let them co-define a learning experience with you. Second thing we need to move on with today's uh, uh, environment, our students to engage in making real things. Product-oriented learning. America actually had somehow by accident had this thing called project-based learning. It's very di diverse. It's not very interesting. I mean, not many projects leads to real cool stuff. Many of you kept your children's products not because they were good, just because they were made by your children. No, that's all. You know, yeah. And now I want to challenge you to say, can you engage your children to make something perfect and great and through the process to learn something in depth? Because today you want to be creative, entrepreneur is not sufficient. You need a lot of disciplined knowledge, disciplined thinking and reflection and that comes from lots of time. We call this greatness. Talents have to be great to be useful. Greatness comes from lots of time. That's from uh, Daniel Coyle's idea. 10,000 hours, you know, Malcolm Gladwell popularized the idea. It's more than 10,000 hours. 9,000 hours might work, you know, but, but anyway, the whole point is that you have spent a lot of time. You cannot ask our children because we're driven by so many, we have to cover so many things. Today, our schools don't prepare children to become great. We prepare them to become mediocre employees to finish the homework for our teachers. We are busy trying to fix the coverage and the pacing. We want to get our children engaged in making something great. The second thing to be great has to do with uh, passion. You can be forced to do a lot of things, 
But without passion, you're not going to become truly great and creative. It has to be passion driven. I can, like in China shows, I can be forced by extrinsic forces to score well, but I will have no interest. And I will be happy to burn the books as long as I pass this test. You know, that, that's, I can do that. I, you know, I can choose. So next thing, everything has to be driven by passion. Today, our students drop out of high schools. You know, one of the big reasons is engagement. They are not interested. They don't care about this stuff, no matter what you do. I mean, you can tell them you have to go to college, otherwise you end up selling drugs about the thing that might be actually more profitable anyway. But the, the, think about children do not think about long-term goals. They're not driven by the national security issue. No matter what County, County, County Rice says, you know, my daughter, who is for can care less about American security. She said, well, I, I migrated to Canada anyway. So that's a different story. Just think about that. Now, we have to be engaged children and make the authentic product drives that. And the third point is that, the third one to make you great is good coaching. Because one hour, 10,000 hours of experience should be different from one hour repeated 10,000 times. If you just repeat the same thing, it doesn't work. A lot of our school work, we don't do that. Teachers serve as the motivators, the pr person who provides feedback, who challenges the students. And finally, we need to think of global competency. You cannot close your doors and get, you know, equip your kids with math scores to compete with others. We have to equip our children to work to think in a globalized context. And to this technology, provides that opportunity. We need to think of our schools as a flat education environment. So just to end, what does this mean? Keep our children out of basement? You basically have to read my book. <laughs> so the, all the time I'm trying to sell my book, I forgot, you know, that's, that's, that's not as shameful, but I will tell you, it's true, you know. So seriously, to end the whole thing, I would argue America education needs to move forward. Not trying to do the same thing as other countries, not trying to be quantitatively different from others. Even if we try all hard, we are not going to be outscore Asian countries. I can tell you this. We have to look at what we're good at, what uniqueness we have. Therefore, I would suggest for all our schools, we should right now end any federal intervention, any state prescription. We get to go back to our schools today with technology, Local schools can collaborate a lot more flexibly across geographical boundaries. I should say all our teachers need not to become content holders or knowledge, knowledge dispensers because Google knows more than any teacher. Our teacher needs to motivate why motivate our students to use Google. Why they need to use Google? I, can, I will argue that today our children will not become successful if they become simply compliant with prescriptions they will become successful when they become great, pursuing their own passion, interested, and be driven to be unique. Again, if Lady Gaga is useful, anyone can be useful. Thank you.